Hi everybody, Nick Blazer here. Um, I had a cool idea for a video, something that I was excited to make and, and share with people. So back after a month or two or a couple after making the last one. Um, but it's about how to figure out what XG is telling us when it makes strange plays, whether it might just be wrong or if there's some concept to learn there that we're just not grasping. Um, and just all like a lot of different tools in XG that you can use to really analyze positions deeper. Um, I'm not sure how much better this will make you at backgammon, but it gives you the tools to be able to figure out for sure what's going on in some of these close or confusing positions um, when you're not sure if you can trust the bot or not. Um, this particular position that you're looking at came from this backgammon logic uh, Facebook group that I think Ali Buren created. He had posted this position here and you can see the bot is suggesting uh, a bit of a strange play here, trying to figure out why that's going on. Um, so I had a lot of fun with this last night and that's what uh, made me kind of want to share how I figured out what I did with this. And we can see, um, sure enough, the top play that comes out is this strange looking eight to three, six to three. Um, my first hint that maybe it was doing something a little bit strange was that um, if we, so we go find Ali's play, the seven to four, seven to two, make two points. It seems reasonable in case there's contact, can't be too bad for the race. Um, so if we run this on a higher analysis setting, they, they get a lot closer. Um, so I'm already a little bit suspicious, you know, that, that maybe for some reason um, at three ply, XG is not looking as far as ha ahead and can't see how this game is going to go and thinks that there's some concept that's important with this play that as we get further down the game, we realize it's not, you know? Um, I started to, if XG was right here, I, I think the theory that I would come up with is that it's telling us that it's important to save a crossover in this position and that the, the spare on the three is not too much wastage to deal with. If we look at this final position and clearly XG does not want to play for contact at all here is white. Uh, we're 18 pips ahead in the race. Um, so it seems to be saying, by the way, this is DMP, if you didn't notice, it seems to be suggesting that, that we just need to maximize our chances of consolidating, uh, a, a race. And one thing we can do to, to kind of confirm or deny that, that theory, um, is look at dice distribution. Um, by the way, you might notice over here that I rolled this out and it seems that on a rollout, the, like a normal play comes out much better. Um, we'll talk about that too, but I think it's really important, you know, you can run that, but it'll take a while for a good rollout to complete. So it's nice to kind of check some other things to see if you can, uh, what else you can learn about the position and what, what these different levels of analysis are telling us. Um, so by the way, the first thing I'll mention, you'll notice that I have the win gammon, uh, backgammon numbers here. Not everyone has that. Some people have it set up as the bar instead. Uh, that's a new move. I think uh, that's if you right click and go over <laughs> display winning percentage, um, the graphic bar, what does this tell us? Uh, I don't understand. It just must be people that haven't found that change in settings, but this is so much more useful to me, I think, to, you know, this is a DMP game, so not as valuable, but to be able to see what the different things are that are going on with each individual play. So I recommend they using that for sure. Um, but also we can take these two plays and right click and go to dice distribution to see what's happening in general after each play. Um, so if you didn't know that you could highlight two plays um, to look at dice distribution, distribution at the same time, that is a thing you can do. So, so hopefully that's already useful to someone. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of get these to compare. I think in this one, the graph is maybe a little bit more useful, um, just trying to figure out what's going on here. And we can see this kind of plays to this theory of, of XG prioritizing the race. And the reason I say that is I notice that after this save a crossover play, XG evaluates all of, all of Black's worst racing roles, just almost in exact order, as higher equity than it does down here, right? It's saying um, in the long run, we're going to gain a little bit on that. Um, we can see that also if we switch over to the second role, um, it's interesting to see that, that our best roles tend to do a little bit better after we take two crossovers, which is no big surprise. Um, 
probably eight to five, eight to three is even better there. Um, so we can see we're sacrificing something with this play in the race, like a little bit. But the equity gained when our opponent rolls poorly in the race and we have more chances of, of clearing safely, we have more time, um, seem to outweigh that, you know, according to this. Um, another thing that you might want to mess around with up here, too, is uh, I don't remember if it shows what it runs this on by default, but you can always click four ply to make sure that, you know, it looks a little further ahead and, and gets a little deeper analysis and it might change a little bit, but same theme here. Um, another, this is a strange idea though, but I also got interested in just um, kind of exactly what roles are the best ones afterwards or what sequences. And so in order to see that, I pulled up this eight to three, six to three, and looked at the dice distribution. Oops, sorry, I still have them both highlighted. Let's uh, do it like this. And then I looked at the details here, and this you'll see gives you in equity order um, the you know the best sequences that happen. Um, and I remember noticing pretty quickly that there were some strange things going on here. And I'll, I'll get it so it shows up at the top of the screen. But if I scroll down a ways, what really stood out to me was that when our opponent, after our play, where we destroy our board, when our opponent rolls a 3-2, XG wants him to break the 16 to the 14. And if we happen to roll double twos, we're going to hit and clean up. Um, I wasn't sure about this, like why, why we would want to create contact that way necessarily, 2-2. Two, two. And um, I think if you, if you hit on a different ply, it's going to change the numbers around a little bit too. Um, but this was an indication to me that something funky is kind of going on here. Um, and maybe XG is struggling with this position. Um, so sure, let's, let's go back to, to this real quick, put it up here and switch it. And I think actually double twos was even more interesting. Uh, so now if we run this, what does XG think we should do on double twos? Uh, 16 to 14, <laughs> maybe make a point with it. So we should play with for contact is what it's saying, and some other ones look good too. Uh, what if we remove the analyze and do plus plus? I think it'll actually run them. And still, it comes up with kind of an even stranger play maybe, a little more racing oriented but it really thinks we should break for contact. And I was kind of surprised with this. It's not a very human play. I guess we have a bunch of blots behind, um, so we can, but it's not super clear to me what we gain by doing this. Um, so I looked through the playlist and noticed that it doesn't have any non-splitting plays. That's a little strange. Um, so if you ever see that come up, you know, when there's a lot of different play options, sometimes the lower plies eliminate uh, plays from consideration completely. And you have to enter themself yourself if you want to see how they would fare. Um, so you can go to add a move and say, well, maybe what I would have played over the board was seven to five and then six to two and four to two. I'm going to make a board point and bring one in. I don't know for the race. Sure. But I want to keep my 16. So I add this play and now everything else is a blunder and this is much better. <laughs> so, so it's clear that XG is really struggling with this. And part of this eight to three, six to three evaluation includes the sequence where black rolls a two and makes some splitting play and it doesn't benefit him as much as, as it should. Um, so it's going to be difficult for, for XG to properly analyze this one, but I feel like this is enough to look at and say, okay, I think it's expecting to get some additional value out of this, out of this keeping a spare outside kind of play that's probably not realistic. Um, and probably just kind of misguided. Um, so with this one, I already feel pretty confident that that probably XG is just misunderstanding this and I'm going to have trouble, you know, um, completely trusting its results. Um, but we did roll it out too. And I think it's it's relevant to point out that even though it does favor 7-4, to 7-2, uh, the rollout is doing these plays on plus plus. It's going to suffer the same challenges that, that the evaluation does. So it's kind of surprising that it realizes um, just making this natural play does better, even though it's going to make the same mistakes on both sides after the eight to three, six to three uh, position. But 
just kind of for getting the most confidence you can out of this. So this one feels like an important one to run on plus plus since we have so much variance in the plays at different uh, plies. But um, can show you a little bit about rollouts and how I deal with those too. So I'm going to click extend just to get this status bar. And when you get that, I'm going to interrupt right away. But if you click on the bar, it brings up this analysis queue window. And then you can see details of the rollout that occurred, how many uh, games it went through, the expected value or equity of each play after that many of games, and its confidence interval. Um, so this is telling us that it expects uh, 7 to 4, 7 to 2's equity afterwards is plus 0.375, plus or minus 0.018. Um, so you can imagine the reason it, the rank, uh, the confidence in the rank is only 85% is because if if we've evaluated 7 to 4, 7 to 2 on the high end by 0.018 and 8 to 3, 6 to 3 on the low end by 0.018, the plays could reverse. Um, but this rollout is good enough to me to show for me to show me that they're both at a minimum very close, right? And it's kind of pick them and there isn't this like blunder potential like we thought with the original analysis by not playing 8 to 3, 6 to 3. So that's valuable information and you might use that to understand how long you should let a rollout go and and the degree of certainty with the choices you know if you run it slower it might still have high confidence because it places the equity is quite a bit different but the confidence still could be kind of swingy um another thing to consider i won't get too deep into it because i think dirk's book covers it better but just rollout settings um if we go look at those i'm using my custom setting one which just does plus plus on everything um the search interval kind of slows things down quite a bit so often i leave that there but that's a uh, reasonable to change it if you really want to make sure that it's trying to find the best plays. And I click variance reduction off, which I think Dirk actually recommends you keep on. I think that should allow the result to converge with confidence to something faster, but I would expect it would be less accurate because it's using uh, one ply to understand how good and bad roles were, which is just going to be inaccurate. So it's going to swing the equity again. Um, so faster, but, but less um, accuracy in the result. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's this position. I have a couple other ones, but I, th I think that's everyone, everything I wanted to cover here is just kind of how we can play around with some of these strange situations and notice when, like when XG is doing something strange and why, um, another interesting one I saw where XG is actually right in the end, I think. It's, the jury's out. We'll see <laughs> if Derek has some feedback on it. But this came up in the Theory of Backgammon Facebook group, another really cool group to uh, see interesting positional uh, information. And in this position, let's go see if we can find it. Um, what Dirk stated in his post, he did a rollout in Plus Plus and has done a lot of the work that I was just kind of showing already with this position. Um, but his confusion was that, in theory, he thought that it can never be correct to send a cube if you have no market losers. Here, XG wants to send this cube and thinks the equity is 0.053 higher. Um, but if we go to dice distribution, as we noticed, it shows the equity of, above of all the different sequences. And we can see it also shows down uh, below the results that the market losers, there are 0%. There are none. Um, and we can also see that just scrolling through the results that, that like our best, our best sequence doesn't lead to a market loser. Um, so what's going on here, right? It just seems like maybe XG is losing its mind too. Uh, this one, I convinced myself though, that, uh, it's just something we didn't understand about the game. And I think a way that we can see that is, um, we'll do the dice distribution again, but I think what XG is telling us is that this, this market loser theory works great in something like a post Crawford scenario where it really doesn't matter whether you send it now or later for yourself. Um, it, you know, like it, as long as you're not losing your market, right? As long as you don't risk doing that, that is not gonna impact your decisions. You're gonna play DMP anyway, and the, the decision will be equivalent. Um, here, the scenario could very much be different a sequence from now. And if the cube's on our side versus the cube being on the other side at four, you can see in this game we're three-way, four-way, by the way. So our decision to send the cube will make gammons irrelevant on both sides and we'll play a DMP game for the match. And I think what, I, what XG is telling us is that we're a slight equity favorite 
if we go ahead and play a DMP game for the match and a slight underdog if we leave Gammons relevant. And a lot of the, the question about this market loser theory was, well, we could always just send the cube later. But the problem is that we might make a play where we don't have a cube anymore, and we might end up stuck playing this game with the cube active and Gammons relevant. So I don't think that's entirely true. And, and one piece that you can look at in the dice distribution here to kind of see how that is, that the cube position is impacting checker plays. I mean, my theory would be, if that's true, we must have to play the checkers different at some point because of the relevance of Gammons versus DMP um, for the equity to be better after sending the, the cube. And if I pull up dice distribution, I think that uh, we had average on here somewhere. I'm trying to remember how it got to this. Um, there is... Let's go to our first roll. Yeah, okay, this is a little easier to see it. So I have five, five in there. You can see down there um, with the cube on our side that we're gonna make the 12 point and hit on the five. And um, if we check this after double take, you see our five, five gets much better. We're gonna play to the 12, make the 13 and hit on the five, which I guess is a little looser somehow. You know, the equity is one, seven, six, one, five, six here. But after double take, it's it's a little worse, actually, for this particular role. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, but you can see there's a difference in checker plays, which um, I think is about the relevance of gammons again, right? And we can find some roles that change that way by using dice distribution to just try to, to see which ones um, are impacted. But yeah, we can see it when we run it here, too, that our 5-5, five, five, we should make the 8 and hit on the 5, actually, after plus plus. Um, with the cube on our side. Um, and I think it's forcing us to kind of consider buttoning up and getting off gammons a little bit. And then when we send it over on four for DMP, now we have a fairly different play. We're going to break, we're going to make the nine instead and hit um, and breaking the 19. So it's hard to see exactly how these, like why the swing's so different and it could still be off. But, but I think the, the idea remains that if the checker plays are different, um, then our equity after, like, based on where the cube is, could be very different. And we might end up with not a cube after the next sequence. So that's another thing that we can check too, right? So if we do double action and look at dice distribution, I'm sure we can find some sequence where it would be disastrous to send a cube after the roll, right? And we're maybe losing a gammon and sad about that. Um, so this was an interesting one to try to figure out too, where is like, is XG just crazy because of how we understand things or is there something to learn? I learned something from this. Um, I don't think my advice would be to, to do anything with this particular law. I think it's still like a very useful, almost like a 99% rule of thumb that if we don't have a market loser, we shouldn't send. That's probably very practical uh, advice to use, but it turns out that in this one case, it's not, I think. Um, so just one last kind of cube studying position. Oh, I had this one too, just to show that like XG can be wildly off sometimes. This is fun. I don't know if you guys have seen this position, but we've just stacked all of our checkers on the 12 and the opponents. This is just the longest pure race that we can play. Uh, two ply thinks it's uh, a beaver if we cube and we should pass the beaver. And then three, three ply thinks it's a pass for black. And it just kind of jumps back and forth. So there are areas where clearly XG doesn't know what's going on. It's funny too. Plus plus gets a lot closer, but it thinks white is an underdog <laughs> for some reason. Um, even though I think it's pretty intuitive that it must not be, right? Um, but so there are places where XG doesn't know what's going on. Um, it's just tempting to, to dismiss that if you don't understand and just assume XG doesn't know what's going on instead of trying to figure out what it's trying to tell us in some given position. Um, what else do we have here? Yeah, this is another confidence interview interval. Um, I think this was a cube that I looked at. I was just curious. Um, Ian Terry had shared an interesting position where I was curious if the roll before it must have been a double, but, but we were curious about this one because the plies again, a good hint that maybe it's not seeing far enough into the future XG is when two ply, three ply, I think it's a huge error to cube. When we plus plus it, it drops quite a bit. Um, but in this one, I convinced myself that XG knew what was going on ultimately because the rollout still gets the confidence. You know, it, 
it's about the same difference as the plus plus was saying. So probably it's right that it's not a cube, you know? Um, but yeah, one other one to get kind of more cube information. This was a fun one that um, Key and Marin here in Madison shared with me. Um, it's a score cube where we're leading five away, seven away, and white doubles. And we can see it's a tough one to adjust for over the board, but it's a take. Um, and it's a pass for money. Um, so an interesting thing to do though, is like, it's, it's easy to see that. And of course we want to be able to adjust over the board for score related plays and, and try to have an idea. Well, five away, seven away is kind of sensitive. So maybe I can take a little deeper and we're going to need rules of thumb like that, but I think it can be a helpful study tool to use everything XG has available to understand why that is. Um, so if you go up to the analyze menu and look at cube information, I don't really mess with match equity table either too much, but that's what it's gonna base a lot of these off of. Um, but on cube information, we can learn some specifics about what's going on here. Um, we can see like uh, trying to figure out as black why I need to take this when it was a pass from money. Um, we can look over here as a first indicator at what our live and dead cube take points are and see that they're lower than a normal score, but that might not account for it entirely, but that it's certainly a, a factor. Um, something to look at too is maybe because of the discrepancy in the score, sometimes the gammon value might drop on the two cube and the gammons might be worth a little less for white after sending. Um, but we can see here they're 0.473 on this side of cube and when you change it to a two cube, that they're still a little bit more valuable than for money. So, so gammons are actually a little bit better than usual. So that should lean us back towards passing. Um, so what else might be going on here? What happens with the recube now that we're on two? And we can see on the one, it's showing us a cube to two what happens. On a cube to two, uh, when black's sending back to white, we can see that the dead cube is slightly higher than for, than for money and we have very little recube vig. The live cube isn't much lower at all um, because of course we'll be sending it for match to gain one point, right? I think it's fairly intuitive once you look at that, but you can see the exact numbers, what's going on there. Um, and also if we just change that hypothetical cube to, or yeah, the, the cube to four, um, sorry, sending two to four isn't gonna play for the match. It's just going to, um, it's going to be very difficult. We're not going to send it from four to eight, right? Yeah. So we do have little, very little recube thing, um, like I was saying. And on the four cube as well, you know, if black does end up turning around and sending it back, then our gammon value is going to drop and blacks is going to go up a decent amount, you know, getting close to two thirds. So um, just thinking through the scenarios, the reason that go, this goes from a, a pass for money to a take at the score is that when black gets to recube, uh, white's going to have to pass a little bit earlier. If they do take, the four cube isn't going to come back on an eight very often. And if they take, uh, you know, winning a gammon for the match is a little bit more valuable than usual. So we've got a little bit more value down the road than we normally would in this kind of scenario. Um, so yeah, that's kind of something that you can use to study cubes a little closer and try to get a better feel for the flavor of scores and you can change things around here quite a bit. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a bunch about how to play around with the tool and really understand what's going on with XG. I don't know how often that, of course, you're not going to be thinking about this over the board, hopefully, but, but it can be interesting if you're really lost with the position, trying to find some logic for it to, to try to establish what's going on um, and really understand all the tools you have available in extreme gamma to sort these kinds of problems out. I hope that's interesting to you, and I'm excited to do some commentary soon in Istanbul, so hopefully I'll see more of y'all soon. Bye, everybody.